how's it going? My name is Benji, and this is the first episode of my Beginner's Guide to Ambient Music series. As you can see, this episode is pretty long, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground here. I'm going to list a table of contents with a bunch of time codes right next to me, so feel free to skip to whatever you want to hear me talk about, or just sit back and watch the whole thing. This episode is going to be focusing on the first question that I asked when I started getting interested in creating ambient music. And that question is, what instruments do I need? What effects do I need? Uh, when do I have enough instruments or enough effects to start creating music? Now, the big answer I'm going to give to you right off the bat is, if you've been doing music for any amount of time, you probably already have all the tools you could possibly need at your disposal. I personally really like working with hardware gear, so pedals, physical instruments, hardware synthesizers, tape loops, that sort of thing. But you absolutely don't need any of that. All you need is the willingness to get creative with what you have. I'm gonna use a lot of hardware examples here, but pretty much everything I do could easily be replicated in a free digital audio workstation with some good sample selection and just some work on the effects side of things. At the end of the day, it ends up being more about the work you put in after recording the thing. So there's that. For those of you who are a little more interested in the hardware side of things, I would encourage you to spend more time looking at the type of gear I'm using less than the actual piece of gear. There are hundreds of dirt cheap delay and reverb pedals, as well as tons of amazing sounding experimental pedals that maybe just didn't work out for my sounds. This is a collection of gear that I have from the past like five or six years of buying gear for various bands, various projects, and I really like what I'm using right now, but what works for me might not work for you. So with that being said, let's get into my first setup. So this first setup is going to be a guitar-based setup. Now, guitar has been my primary instrument for years at this point, and it's absolutely the most comfortable instrument for me. And because it's so popular as an instrument, there is a wealth of resources on how to use a guitar in an ambient context. A uh, guitar setup is also generally fairly accessible, just due to not only the high amount of affordable guitar pedals, and effects that are always being announced and developed, but also the digital guitar modeling software world that lots of professionals use has really gotten good over the past few years. So if you want a large number of options or if you already play some guitar, I think that this is a great place to start your ambient journey. All right, so I've pulled out my guitar and I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of my pedal board. And before I get to it, yes, I know that my pedal board looks kind of weird right now. I took off a high gain pedal and put the volume pedal on just for this video. So feel free to roast me in the comments. All right, so the first things I'm gonna recommend you to get are the pedals at the end of my pedal board. Specifically, a reverb, a delay, and a looper pedal. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna make a bit of a statement. Uh, if you walk away from one thing after watching this video, it's that looper pedals are the most important type of pedal you could get. Every setup I show you is going to use a looper in some way or another. I just think they're incredibly valuable tools. Um, they're great for songwriting because you can put ideas down in real time and just listen to them back and start building off of them. They're great for live things if you want to create an atmosphere and then let that atmosphere sit for a little bit before you start moving on to something else. And it just does something, it's, there's just something magical about it. So yeah, I really highly recommend getting a looper pedal. As for the delay and the reverb, these are probably the second and third most valuable things that you could have in an ambient setup. Uh, I love using reverbs and delays to just create washes of sound and drown out the original signal and create different textures and background noises. And then, 
once you've created a texture you really like, you'll put it into a looper, and then you can start adding things on top of it. So let me show you an example of how that would sound. Next thing I'm going to recommend is you're probably going to want a volume pedal and a compressor of some sort. Uh, and this is specifically for swells, making a swell sound, which is this sound. I use these two things together all the time, and this is a specific tip from Andy Offling and his series on ambient guitar. Uh, he makes the point that when you put the compressor in front of the volume pedal, it kind of sticks everything together, uh, it kind of gives everything a little bit of a glue, and then you just fade up that sound and all your notes are already sustaining really nicely, and it just makes everything really clear and smooth. I've tried lots of different places with compressors, no compressors, compressor before and after volume pedal, and personally I think that the best spot for an ambient setup is directly before your volume pedal. Last thing you might want is an overdrive or a distortion as well as maybe a modulation like a flanger or a chorus or a phaser. So these things are not necessary at all, but if you want to create a little bit of a difference in a sound and you have one lying around, throw it in there and just see what happens. Uh, you, you'll be surprised at some of the stuff that uh, you can make come out and the weird harsh noises you can make sound really pretty. So let me do a quick example using everything that I've shown you right here.
Now another great option for an ambient setup is to get some sort of a groove box. A groove box is a term used to describe a synthesizer that has some level of self-contained functionality. Usually this includes a built-in sequencer, built-in effects, maybe samplers, options for sound shaping and creation, but each type of groove box does vary from model to model, so keep your eye out for what you particularly want. Some popular groove boxes out there are the Electron Digitact, the Critter and Guitari Organelle, and the one I'm going to be using to demonstrate is the Teenage Engineering OP-1. Now, I know that there's a lot of talk as to whether or not this instrument is worth its hefty price tag, and I definitely don't think it's for everybody. But that's a discussion for a different video. Personally, I really enjoy using it. I think that there's a lot to love with it despite its shortcomings, so let's just get into why I like to use it. Now what I think makes this a really powerful machine for making ambient music is the sampler. Uh, you can sample things directly into the machine, you can grab them from online and put them in there, but that combined with some really interesting sequencers and also a tape machine function on this machine makes it a really powerful tool, in my opinion, for creating some interesting music. So. Uh, Let's dive in. I'm going to go to a folder that I found on opfun.com, which is basically a folder of ambient sounds. And yeah, so let's just kind of go through and see if we can make a little bit of a thing with it. So let's take that sound. It's got... Had a bit of a frequency thing on it. I'm actually going to change that effect to a delay. I'm going to set the feedback pretty high, um, and I'm gonna put the input level also pretty high so that it... And let's go to the tape machine, and let's just take out a random four bars. All right, and so this is gonna be our little loop length, and I'm just gonna record. Alright, so that's one little loop down. Let's go in here and find a different sound we can use. Alright, so this next sound I found is the piano. I'm gonna bring that down an octave and let's also put some delay on that. And let's record that into our loop. that let's throw in one more sound and I'm recording this all to one track you can record these all in separate tracks there's a lot there's a lot of functionality in here but uh all right I've chosen this sound and I'm gonna let's see what effect do I want to put on that I'm gonna actually put a uh this this really not particularly great sounding reverb on it uh, and I kind of like the fact that it kind of sucks as a reverb because it really gives things a, like a real buzz to them which I'm gonna put that on a separate track and then just mix that down. Let's record that on to track two.
this is. You can slow that down by half, and that creates a really, really weird and kind of broken sound to it, which I really like, so. And yeah, that's just a couple minutes and I've created a nice wash of sound that you can use with a groove box. And again, each different groove box kind of has its own little things going on, but I like what I've come up with right now. So yeah, let's move on to the next thing. All right, so let's move on to something a little more lo-fi like a little more gritty and weird and this was the thing that really started me on a path to understanding how powerful small sounds can be and that's the world of tape loops. So for those of you who don't know, a tape loop is where you take a magnetic tape, generally from a cassette, uh, but it can be done with a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine as well, and you cut the tape into a small segment and loop it on itself. And then you just put it in a tape player and let it play for as long as you want. Now, tape loops are great for a few reasons. First of all, it's a very sensitive form of audio capture, so there's a high probability that as time goes on, your tape loop will degrade and fall apart, creating more interesting sounds and mangling what you've already recorded into something new and something unexpected. Uh, secondly, it's an analog waveform, which means if you change the speed it's played back at, it warps in some really cool and natural sounding ways. Third, it can be a very involved process. You can make the tape loops yourself. You can find new ways to loop it around the cassette inside to make it longer. You can take the top off of the machine and carefully loop it around something in the room to make loops that are like 20 or 30 seconds long. There's just so much you can do with it and it's Pretty cheap, relatively speaking. You can usually find some crappy Walkman clones on Amazon for like less than $20 new, and eBay is full of a bunch of people selling tape recorders secondhand for pretty decent prices. Uh, I got this one new from literally like a Target for like $20, $25. It has a built-in microphone. I took the lid off so it could run longer loops around the room, and it's great. Uh, does it sound good? No, <laughs> no, uh, but does that matter? Also no, it's about lo-fi sounds and strange sounds. All right, let me show you a quick little example here. I recorded with a friend's four track tape machine. Uh, there's four separate recordings of different violin notes on it. And yeah, let's just see how that sounds. And now a last little idea here for this section. While this is not a tape loop, uh, your phone can be a great little portable recorder to add to a really dirty, nasty, lo-fi aesthetic. Uh, and if that's a thing you're into, you might want to try this out. Maybe take it outside, do some field recordings, or record something weird and play it next to a tape loop, and then you'll probably get something that's really interesting and really special. So give that a shot. All right, so I'm trying to alternate between more accessible and less accessible setups, and I'm just gonna come right out now and say that if you're thinking of starting to make ambient music, this next setup is not the way to go. Uh, modular synthesis is a really rewarding and powerful way to make music, but it is absolutely not for everybody, and you need to spend a lot of time researching what you would want in your case. 
If you don't put in the work, it's 100% possible that you could blow $1,500 or more on something that doesn't even make sound by itself. It just has a bunch of pretty lights. So I would absolutely recommend starting in a software environment like VCV Rack as a place to like dip your toes in, see if you're comfortable with it, see if you want to pursue this in a hardware format. That's how I started and I think it was a great place to start and it was a really great place to learn. Now as for those of you who want to try to actually build a rack, let me try to give you a few pieces of advice. First of all, self-contained voice modules are a great place to start when planning your rack. Something like Platts by Mutable Instruments, the BIA by Noise Engineering, or IntelliGel's Plonk are fully formed voices, and all you need to activate them is a trigger to make it play a note, and a control voltage to give it pitch information. Uh, next up, I would also say put as much modulation and random sources in your case as you can manage. You can do a lot with just a few voices, provided you can make sure that things are constantly changing, moving, and evolving. Lastly, a way to interface the synthesizer with non-modular effects is incredibly valuable. There are some effects that either don't exist in modular format or are much cheaper outside of a modular format, and the ability to route in and out of the machine can be really useful in that regard. So let me show you an example patch. All right, so what I have here is my modular synthesizer, which I've kind of designed specifically for ambient sounds and ambient noises. So I'm just gonna show you a really quick little patch of just kind of a basic way of, that you can use something like this. So right now I'm going to send the output of the IntelliGel Plonk into a pedal interface. So I'm sending it to these pedals right up here out of view. One of them is a delaying looper and the other is just a crazy weird pitch shifting delay, which I love. And then I'm sending that into a small version of the module clouds and I'm using the tape delay mode on it. And first things first, I'm just gonna kind of turn down the regular delay signal and just make sure the reverb is turned up a little bit. Cool. So let me just hear how that sounds. Let me turn the modular up first. Cool. So that right there is our starting sound, and let me mix it into the delay. Ooh, we are already getting some sounds from the delay. Cool. So let's get this thing triggering itself with just some random pitches and random gates. So.
sine wave out of this oscillator, and I'm going to let me give it a volume knob actually. So, and I'm going to take this basic sine wave oscillator, and I'm going to just kind of slowly like add just a real like droney sound. So the last thing I'm going to cover is something I feel like you should be trying to use as often as possible and can be used to an extent with all of these setups, and that is acoustic instruments. If you want your ambient music to sound natural, using natural sounds from natural instruments is kind of the most logical way to go about it. And what's great is it doesn't really matter what you have or how qu high quality of an instrument it is, because there's usually some way to make it sound interesting. Uh, for example, right here I have a very low-cost acoustic guitar that probably hasn't had a string change in about five years. Um, yeah, and then I also have a violin here that I used to play in high school for orchestra. And then you can really easily just combine these two with a looper and make something that sounds really interesting. I really think that anything natural sounding that you can work into your soundscapes is going to create a much more tangible sort of response to your music, whether it's a field recording or you literally hitting something physically like the back of a guitar or a cup with a knife. I don't really care. There's always some weird strange resonance there and it always adds to the character of the music that you're creating. So I highly recommend recording acoustic instruments. Thank you for sticking with me all the way through till the end. I hope that this has been informative to you on some of the many different ways that you can approach this type of music. I really want to stress again that it's not about the specific tools I use, and you can do anything with anything you have. 
I'm just here to show you how I use what I use. And hopefully it inspires you to take what you have and do something interesting with it. If there's anything you found helpful, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment if you have any questions. Subscribe for more because in the next episode, I want to talk about my approach to actual songwriting and how I personally try to build out compositions into full tracks. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.